Funding for This is Nashville comes from you, our listeners, and Music City Prep Clinic, Nashville-based provider for prep and offering comprehensive sexual health services in an environment designed to be safe, professional, and shame-free. Learn more at musiccityprep.org. I'm Khalil A. Colonna, and this is Nashville. One year ago, when the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, it changed the outlook of reproductive health care for millions of people across the country. In 13 states, including Tennessee, trigger laws went into effect, banning abortion in the first and second trimesters. Our state has now has some of the most restrictive abortion laws in the nation. Millions of Tennesseans who are pregnant or could become pregnant are now faced with important decisions about their health and their futures. Today, we'll learn what the past year has been like for them, for providers, and for reproductive health care advocates. Joining me now is WPLN's new health reporter, Catherine Sweeney. Hey, Catherine, welcome to This is Nashville. Thank you for having me. Really great to have you with us. So before we talk about how this ban is affecting reproductive reproductive health care in Tennessee, I want to first give our listeners a little bit of background on you. You've been a health care reporter for some time, even before coming to Nashville, right? That's right. Yeah. So I have been covering health in some form or another for years and years. I covered Oklahoma's state house for a while. There I wrote about Medicaid and hospital funding, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, and abortion. I wrote about that mostly from a political angle. Uh, the legislature and the Supreme Court would fight over it, right? Kind of like Tennessee. Mm-hmm. Um, and then in 2020, I started covering health full time. I heard that the abortion conversation was about to change because there were changes on the Supreme Court. And just a couple of years later, Dobbs happened. And the conversation is very different now in states like Oklahoma and Tennessee. Okay. So since then, what has healthcare been? been like without this option in Tennessee? Yeah, yeah. So Tennessee was one of the states that had a trigger ban in place. So as soon as that decision dropped, you couldn't get an abortion here anymore. And um, Tennessee was was a state that was like a lot of other ones where they had multiple laws in place. But the, the one that is in effect now, it kicked in in August. It's one of 13 states where you can't get an abortion anytime. There are a handful of others where they say you can't get one after 12 weeks or you can't get one after 16 weeks. But here in Tennessee, it was, you know, pretty much it's immediately. And there are very, very narrow exceptions and they're a little murky. They're kind of hard to follow. Um, And then around the same time, a little bit before here in Tennessee, a lot of these anti-abortion states Uh, did something that maternal health advocates have pushed for for a long time. They pushed for getting Medicaid to cover people after they give birth for longer. So they, traditional Medicaid and all these states, they had covered these people for 60 days after they give birth. Um, There are a lot of problems that can kill people that last for longer than 60 days. Heart problems, people develop a lot of blood pressure problems when they're pregnant, diabetes, dental issues. So uh, yeah, it's it's a year now here in Tennessee and a lot of other states that have banned abortion. And it's kind of seen as this trade-off, right? You know, you can't get an abortion anymore, but if you are pregnant, you get to have Medicaid a little bit longer. Um, and you know, it, it's supposed to be addressing this really big issue, which is maternal mortality. Mm. So you're saying maternity, maternal mortality is a big concern. Have you talked with providers about maternal mortality trends or any other concerns they have since the ban? Yeah. So, um, Tennessee is kind of in a way known for maternal mortality. It has one of the highest rates in the country. Um, and some of these causes of death, again, like blood pressure problems, diabetes, it takes longer than 60 days, but, um, that's why they pushed for that extension. But yeah, I mean, there are a lot of a lot of problems with that. Um, and then there are a lot of problems with people um, possibly like having babies when they don't want to now that abortion mm-hmm. is in place. We heard about that um, in, a, in a briefing today with Planned Parenthood. They had a briefing with reporters about what this has all looked like in the year since Dobbs. You attended that briefing. Yeah. What did they say? Yeah, they were they were confirming that there's a lot of unknowns at this point. It's only been a year. So health data notoriously takes a really long time to come out. 
for example, we kind of wanted to look at are there more babies being born, but um, it takes 18 months from the end of the calendar year for that to come out. So we're, we have no idea if there's been more babies born in 2022, 2023. But um you know, these providers, they're surmising based on some numbers that they do have that more people are giving birth than there were before. Um, here's Dr. Ashley Caulfield. She's the CEO of Planned Parenthood of Tennessee and North Mississippi. We've navigated and provided financial assistance to 500 people since the abortion ban. We had estimated two to 3,000 because there are other abortion funds. We didn't expect to get everybody, but we expected a couple of thousand people at, at a minimum to reach out and ask for help. And we have been shocked by how low the numbers are of people who are asking us for help, regardless of how much we've advertised and tried to be very um, transparent about what we're doing. Right. So she's kind of saying, you know, there are people who are traveling state, you know, out of the state without Planned Parenthood, with help from other people or maybe on their own. But um, there are, are probably a lot of people who can't leave the state and, and haven't contacted agencies like theirs for help. Um, it, it's expensive. It's difficult. So they're expecting that we're going to see more births in coming months compared to pre-dobs. Um, and, of course, that's going to impact all these other challenges with maternal health care that we talked about a few minutes ago. What are policymakers saying that they're doing to help new moms? Well, one of the big things that um, policymakers here, especially Governor Bill Lee, have pushed for is giving money to these so-called pr crisis pregnancy centers. Uh, state budget officials gave them $20 million this year. Hmm. And there are these organizations that um, you know, anti-abortion advocates are really supportive of because they give these patients, um, you know, alternatives to abortion. But medical providers, including like the American Medical Association, are very critical of them because they're not technically medical providers. They're not licensed like medical providers. They're not subject to the same privacy laws, and they don't even necessarily have to have medical pro medical providers on site. People who are not medical providers can give ultrasounds. Um, and so there's just there's a lot of controversy around those. You're just starting out in your role mm -hmm. as WPLN's healthcare reporter. What kind of stories are you interested in? Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm obviously interested in looking at how these abortion bans are affecting Tennessee and maternal health generally. Um, I'm really interested in looking at kind of the good and the bad of health care in Tennessee. I mean, Nashville is known as the Silicon Valley of healthcare. There's major corporations that affect the whole country based here. There's incredible medical research coming out of Nashville. So I think that that's really fascinating. But, you know, at the same time, Tennessee has a lot of health disparities. Um, people of color here, people who live in rural areas, they're not getting the same access to health care. And, you know, the question is kind of Nashville it's the leader in healthcare in the United States. So if people here are still struggling, what does that mean for everyone else? Catherine Sweeney is WPLN's new healthcare reporter. Catherine, welcome aboard and thanks for your reporting. Thank you. We have to take a short break. When we come back, we'll look at what the last year has been like in our state since the overturning of Roe v. Wade. How do you feel about the elimination of federal abortion rights? Tweet us at This Is Nashville. We'll be right back. Funding for This is Nashville comes from you, our listeners, and Music City Prep Clinic, Nashville-based provider for prep and offering comprehensive sexual health services in an environment designed to be safe, professional, and shame-free. Learn more at musiccityprep.org. I'm Khalil A. Colonna, and this is Nashville. Since Roe v. Wade was overturned last year, ending the federal right to an abortion, access to abortion in our state has come to a halt. Several reproductive care facilities, both in Middle Tennessee and statewide, have shut down. Pregnant people have had to travel to Illinois and beyond to receive the health care that they need. And many doctors are afraid of being criminalized for giving medical care or even advice. 
To get a sense of how Nashvillians are feeling about life post row, we sent our producer, Elizabeth Burton, out around town. Thoughts on abortion, man. Whew. What a start. I mean, it's been a very controversial topic for years. We have a lot of our males in politics trying to police women's bodies. I'll be glad when something happens to where we can take control of our own bodies and we're respected as women. It's just and disturbing how much this country prioritizes the lives of unborn children. And I wish that there was a law that could have been signed in the last I don't know, like 50 or so years. I feel like that should have happened by now. There shouldn't be a rule against your own decisions and what you may have been through or are going through. Nobody has control over somebody else's body like we have been led to believe all these different years, centuries. You know, it just sucks that people who are, are wealthy are gonna figure out a way to get an abortion no matter what, and so they're really So to just, have uh, something like Roe v. Wade happen, what does that say to our future generations of these things? I, I'm betting on the younger generation. That was Nick Metlock, Kristen Gray, DZ Violet, John Harriman, Naya, and Nick Valencia. Now, I'd like to welcome my next guest. Dr. Ivana Thompson is a board-certified OBGYN, formerly of Nashville, now in Seattle, and is a former guest of the show. Dr. Thompson, thanks for being with us again. Well, thanks for having me. Really a pleasure. Now, you're now in Seattle after working in Nashville for years. Let me ask, why did you leave? Was it because of Tennessee's abortion ban? The abortion ban definitely played a role in me choosing to leave Tennessee. Um, I was I was given a really excellent opportunity um, last summer to re relocate to Seattle. And as I was considering that option, the Dobbs um, decision came out. And in knowing what the laws were here in Tennessee and anticipating the changes um, to our ability to provide evidence-based safe abortion care, um, that helped, that aided me in making my decision to relocate. How difficult was it for you to make that decision? It was a really tough decision. Like you said, I'm a board certified OBGYN. I take care of pregnant and non-pregnant people and I really enjoy my job. I enjoyed working with my colleagues and I enjoyed taking care of my patients. Um, but working in a state where the laws are formulated in such a way that it made illegal my ability to provide evidence-based care, that was a stress that I didn't want to continue to bear. Take us back to last year. What was okay. your reaction when you heard the news that Roe v. Wade would be overturned by the Supreme Court? My reaction to that news was I wasn't surprised. Um, you and we anticipated it happening. Um, I think those of us who provide this full scope of care, um, who could kind of read the tea leaves from when the case was heard in December, anticipated this being overturned. And so when it happened in June, it wasn't surprising. It was sad. Um, and I feel that once it happened, um, a lot of our healthcare organizations kind of went into high gear trying to figure out what the fallout would be and how we would respond to it. And so it was stressful in that sense, but it certainly wasn't surprising. Did you start adjusting how you ran your practice and the type of care that you were, you know, you were able to provide? Absolutely. Um, I worked really closely with um, the leadership in my, in my medical organization um, and our legal advisors to get an understanding of what the laws were and how they would have an impact on clinical care. And then once we had that understanding, we adjusted how we provided clinic, how we provided this care um, and also kind of made and also made plans for how to refer people um, out of state um, if they needed to access this sort of care. So there's definitely a lot of planning that happened mm. and a lot of adjusting. Now, you told us how much you love your job. You love the services that you provide. Tell me this. You know, what does it feel like as a physician who knows what they want to do for their patients, but they're prevented from doing that care? It's a terrible tension. It feels like stress. It feels heavy. 
um, when you're when you're working with a patient and you're in that you're you're in that patient's room and you've heard their story and you know the medical evidence and you know all the options and you prevent and you present them all to the patients but then you have to come in with a caveat saying like I can't actually provide this care for you in this state because of the law mm. it feels very disheartening and I think the patients have a similar feel similarly when they realize that the person or the team or the place that they've gone to for their care that they put trust in can't meet their needs. It's it's really sad and disheartening. Mm. I'd like to introduce my next guest. Rebecca Boynton is an abortion rights advocate. Rebecca, welcome to This is Nashville. Thanks, Khalil. Thanks for having me. Really great to have you here. So when you heard, I'd like to get your, your reaction. What was your reaction when you heard the Dobbs decision? Um, I was frightened. It felt like uh, my worst fear that was coming coming to life. We already uh, struggle so much with people having empathy for women. And now it just felt like when we're criminalizing uh, women and people who can get pregnant, it was it was terrifying. I understand that you have firsthand experience with abortion, right? I do. I do. Like like so many women and people who can get pregnant. I do. Yeah, I know it may be a sensitive topic for you to discuss, but can you tell us what that experience was like for you? Yeah, you know, it's an experience I don't regret. And it's an experience I'm so glad that uh, I had, um, it was a, a medical procedure I'm so thankful that I had access to. Um, you know, as an advocate, as a 41-year-old woman, as an advocate for maybe that younger person that I was, you know, um, there was another person that played a role in that. And that person is is um, never really forced to kind of uh, rip himself open and talk about this abortion story publicly in the way that I was expected to just to simply human, uh, humanize myself. Mm. And so, um, you know, I look back on that and I see the problems in that when, um, that men are not, uh, a light is not shine on them enough, uh, and their role that is that plays. You went public, like you said, on social media with your experience. Yeah, what yeah. Was, what was the response you got from that? So this was in 2016, 2017, when okay. everything just sort of started falling apart, you know, when it came to abortion rights on all different levels of government. And this was the shout your abortion time, right? We were encouraging women to talk publicly about their abortions. I've always been outspoken ever since I was a very small child. So I did. It was my own personal platforms on social media and it was Facebook. The reaction and the comments was really horrible. I mean, it was it was a lot of attacks from people who don't understand abortion, who are coming at it at an extremely emotional place. Um, the worst, though, probably was the reaction um, from a boss that I had at the time. So um, that was a, a professional backlash. Mm. And now, Dr. Thompson, have you heard stories from your patients that are similar to what Rebecca just shared with us? Yes, we're, yes, I'm definitely hearing stories from patients who, and, and I feel that we're interacting with patients who are coming to physicians with fear, who are, who are feeling the stigma, even if they've not shared um, with their friends or with their family, like what they, what they seek to do or what they want to do. Um, so I feel that when patients are coming into these medical encounters, they're coming in with a with a sense was feeling feared and like a fear of being judged by their providers and this is this all sounds very real mm. yeah rebecca you know did that dobbs decision did it motivate you to become more involved in fighting for reproductive rights it definitely made me want to be more vocal and it definitely made me want to start asking men where are y'all where are your voices um we're, this is maybe an unpopular, you know, uh, opinion, but we're going to have to start placing male faces to some of these discussions. And um, we're going to have to start expecting men because men, they, um, they're, they're, they're in the, the discussion of, hey, we're pregnant. Hey, we're having a, a baby. But they're not, where are they when the discussion is, hey, we're having an abortion, you know, we're going to have to expect them to start doing that. And so that's what I started uh, really being vocal about on, on my personal social media pages, for sure. Did you attend any protests? 
You know, I don't think this past year uh, if I did attend uh, protests, but I know that I've attended plenty of protests Mm -hmm. in the past. Now, 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 as you became more vocal on social media and and, and pushing for reproductive rights, tell me about the conversations you've had since the Dobbs was overturned with your family and friends. You know, um, a lot of my friends... uh, you know, we share a lot of my female friends and and um, women and people who can get pregnant. We they talk to me about um, their experiences with abortion privately, but they don't want to discuss it publicly, which is fair. You know, there's there's I have a feeling that's such two sides to this coin. Coin on one side, I empathize with women. I don't want to expect them to share these abortion stories because it's hard because of the stigma and the and and the backlash. And the reactions that are so ugly and hateful, so hateful. Um, but on the other side of the coin, I know that if we don't talk about them publicly, then we're not going to, we're not going to be able to change. We've got to change hearts and minds. It's got to stop there, start there, excuse me, and not in the legislation. Um, but um, yeah, uh, one of the, the things I did notice, though, real quick is, is when we did lose Roe, um, either on the national level or the state level. I remember in Nashville, the major discussion on my social media pages was the loss of exit in, I remember. And the men mm. were extremely vocal and extremely angry about the loss of the exit in. And um, I had just lost, you know, autonomy over my own health care. Mm-hmm. And I was really incensed. And so that's kind of been um, something that I have used as like a, a way to talk to people about how much more uh, male voices we need. What what conversations have, what have your conversations with men been like? You know, I had a wonderful conversation with one of my male friends recently. He is um, a really brilliant artist. And he asked me, um, do you think that men aren't panicking yet because you can still go out of state to get an abortion? Uh, it's a really good point. And maybe that has something to do with it. But honestly, my 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 answer is no. We have we have um, we've positioned this discussion as a female as a women's issue, and, and it's not. It, it's everyone's issue. We're all affected. Elle and I were talking about this earlier outside in the hall, and it's everyone's issue. And I think another thing that he did discuss with me is that I think men don't know how to be a better um, advocate, and so. I'm I'm here to say you've got to start talking about your role and your experiences with abortion. Right. Elle, she's nodding. If you're just tuning in, this is Nashville and I'm your host, Khalil Colonna. We're talking this hour about what life has been like in the years since Roe v. Wade was overturned by the Supreme Court. And we want to hear from you. So tweet us at This Is Nashville. Now, I'd like to bring in my next guest. L. Robinson is the director of Abortion Access Cookville, which is changing its name to Cookville Community Action. L, thanks for being here. Welcome to This Is Nashville. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Really great to have you. So can you tell us, you know, what the past year has been like for your organization? It has been difficult. Um, we formed in the um, in the aftermath of the Dobbs decision. Um, and in the beginning, we had a lot of passion and a lot of interest with everybody being very interested and ready to go. Um, but we noticed over the past year that interest seems to have died down because we live in a time where there are a lot of very high profile, very scary crises happening all the time. People's attention wanders, Mm. um, which means it's difficult for us to build up a committed, dedicated group of people who want to do this advocacy work, which is when we talk about changing culture so that we have access to abortion, again, reproductive justice in general, any large scale social rights issue, we have to remember that this is a marathon, not a sprint. And last summer, everybody started sprinting. Mm -hmm. Um, And I have to admit that I was 
one of those people. And it's been a learning process over the year to learn that this is a long game. You know, it's fair to say that Cookville is a lot more conservative <laughs> than Nashville. Yes. And abortion is a highly politicized topic. Tell me, how are you engaging with the people out there and letting folks know about the services you provide and what the organization's mission is? So our tactics so far have been to be visible. Um, we've staged demonstrations out on our square. Um, we have done information sessions. Um, and we have started building a coalition, uh, a network of like-minded individuals who are all focusing on different aspects of um, the struggle for a just society. Um, but yes, our big focus is just being visible and not giving in to the shame, intimidation, the fear that we do feel out there. What's been the response to this increased invisibility you all have engaged in? I'm sorry, the, the increased invisibility? Visibility. Ah, um, broadly positive. Um, you said that Cookville is far more conservative than Nashville, and that is broadly speaking true. But I think that when we talk about areas like Cookville, there is this idea that it is a deep red area. The truth, I think, and that seems to be borne out in my experience, is that there are a lot of people who think and feel and believe like I do about this and other issues, but they also believe that it is a deep red area and that they are alone. Mm. They feel isolated and cut off, like there is nobody around to connect with, to do this work with. It's been heartwarming to find that that isn't as much the case as you'd think. Dr. Thompson, you know, you've practiced in a state with an abortion ban and one that grants access to abortion. You know, talk to me about the difference in those environments. Practicing here in Washington State where abortion is protected, there is a palpable decrease in the stress that is associated with work. I feel free in a sense where I can just engage with my patients and talk to them and hear their stories. I can talk to them about what their issues are, talk to them about all of their options for care. And when they choose abortion, they can access it within, within the laws of the state. Um, and it's, it's very freeing to know that I can just concentrate on the provision of evidence-based medical care and not have to be worried or concerned about what can I provide within the limits of a really restrictive law like I, like I had to be worried about in Tennessee. Have you seen, you know, a response to that freedom from your patients as well? Do they come in a lot more relaxed about seeing you and getting care? Um, that's a really excellent question. And I think um, here in here in Washington, I feel like I've cared for a number of Washingtonians, and I, I feel that I feel from the patients that there may be a little less urgency or a little less distress. I feel like when I was caring for patients in Tennessee, um, there was a lot of stress that the patient was bearing on whether or not they could actually get their care. Whereas in Washington State, someone presents and they ask for care. And they generally are able to get it. So I feel that the patients are overall less distressed. Now, we do have a number of patients who are traveling to Washington State from states that have restrictions. And those patients are dealing with a lot of a lot of stress. Um, but with our local patients, I feel not as much. Now, Rebecca, Elle was sharing with us the story about, you know, the sprint versus the marathon initially last year this time. A lot of people were out there. Mm. There was a lot of momentum yeah. for fighting this. But since then, she shared that it's waned a mm. lot across all areas. How do you respond to that waning momentum? Um, the only way I know how to respond to it personally is to do my best to constantly humanize women and people who uh, can get pregnant. Um, there's a lack of empathy for us and um, already that exists. 
we have to tell more stories. You know, we, there's been a, a pretty good campaign um, about a lot of the women in Tennessee who are facing these horrible medical decisions and um, and in viable pregnancies are unviable pregnancies and and we're really bu- buoying those stories and um, but we I think we need to do it more um, we've 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 got to really become more visible and more transparent that's how I know how to do it you know every day someone in our state discovers that they're pregnant yeah every day and some are wanted pregnancies some are unwanted you know, dr. Thompson as a physician who has worked here where do you recommend people turn for reproductive health care? Um, well, I recommend that people, if people have a trusted OBGYN or family doctor who they've been seeing for care, I recommend that they rely on those folks. And what I would hope is that my colleagues who are providing care in Tennessee um, would continue to counsel patients accurately. There's no restriction on our ability to talk to patients about care and care options. And that when someone is choosing abortion care, and if it's not feasible to provide it in the state, that they're getting referrals to um, to organizations outside of the state or funds that can help them travel to access the care. But I would always recommend that people start with a trusted physician and, and ask them to rely on the physicians available to provide that evidence-based, compassionate, consistent care. That is Dr. Ivana Thompson, OBGYN, and Rebecca Boynton, abortions right advocate. I want to thank you both for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And L. Robinson will stick with us through the break. When we come back, we'll look at what's next for reproductive rights and medical care in Tennessee. You can join the conversation by tweeting us at This Is Nashville. We'll be right back. Kalona, and this is Nashville. We're talking this hour about what reproductive health care has looked like here in Tennessee since Roe v. Wade was overturned one year ago this week. Now, before the break, we heard from a physician who moved their practice to another state. Now let's talk with two people who are staying here to keep up the fight for abortion access. Brianna Perry is co-executive director of Healthy and Free Tennessee, which advocates for sexual health and reproductive rights. And Robin Baldridge is the president of Abortion Care Tennessee. Brianna, Robin, thanks for being here today and welcome back to This is Nashville. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Really? Yeah, um, thank you for having me. Happy to be back. Happy, happy to have both of you here for this important conversation. Now, Brianna, what was the biggest impact for your organization when the Dobbs decision was released? Yeah, I, I do want to say a lot has happened uh, in this year. And the biggest thing that we focused on when the decision was released, um, we were doing a variety of things because we had been intentional about making shifts uh, early last year before, like, you know, months before the decision uh, was released, uh, even months before the leak happened last May. And we were uh, thinking about self-managed abortion trainings, ensuring that people, you know, have um, like the resources of the information um, when it came to thinking about like self-managed abortions and what was available, uh, websites, et cetera. And so it was more so trainer trainers. And we, uh, you know, did that uh, work. Uh, We also started a coalition, which has been really exciting. And so it's uh, advocates uh, from different parts of the state. So including Middle Tennessee, but also East Tennessee, West Tennessee, um, to really get on the same page. And so we started at, you know, thinking about that before the decision and really uh, kind of like hone in on that coalition uh, and what work was possible with the coalition um, after the decision. And from that, our focus has really been this legislative year on abortion criminalization work. We have had some exciting wins. So in the midst of so much 
um, I guess, like hostility and the political environment that we're navigating in Tennessee, we've had some wins. And that's uh, that's been uh, very uh, exciting for us and provided some hope. And so that's what we're you know thinking about moving forward and um, just uh, trying to build upon uh, some of the things we've already done and um, just really thinking about what it will look like to get abortion access back in Tennessee, especially thinking about over uh, the next 10 years, what will a strategy look like over the next 10 years? Well, tell me this. What were some of those political wins you just mentioned? Yeah, so um, I'll start with two resolutions that we introduced. One was the first of its kind in the country, and it was a resolution um, that uh, attempted to clarify that pregnant people or their loved ones uh, shouldn't face criminal or civil penalties for their pregnancy outcomes. And so we've you know, been seeing in different states, uh, people who are trying to support folks with access and abortion um, you know, could face uh, civil penalties. We saw what happened in Texas, and this definitely was a fear um, in the wake of Dobbs, uh, the Dobbs decision and something that we were thinking about in, in Tennessee. And so, like I said, it was like the first of its kind of, uh, in this first of its kind, uh, in the country. And we're uh, looking to do more work around it, but excited that it was introduced. We also introduced a contraception access resolution, um, and it passed the Senate. Uh, we're, you know, still going to do some work around that. And that uh, resolution, uh, just reaffirms that, uh, the legislature, Legislature supports contraception access and comprehensive contraception access because I know um, there are a lot of conversations uh, and a lot of uh, just clarity that's needed that as uh, abor abortion, uh, the state of abortion in Tennessee, that you know the legislature isn't going to criminalize uh, contraception access and that that should be available for everyone who needs it. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the biggest win that we had, uh, we were able to, as a part of some legislation, as a part of an exceptions bill that passed this year, uh, to repeal um, this antiquated law. Um, it was an original pre-roll law, uh, one of Tennessee's first anti-abortion laws, and it passed in 1883. And so it was known as attempt to procure a miscarriage. And, you know, it was, uh, you know, initially... Uh, intended to protect pregnant people from higher mortality rates. So thinking back uh, in the 1800s, what abortion access was like, you know, as it was illegal. Mm -hmm. And even though it's, you know, a law that, you know, like, you know, this year uh, was like 140 years and Roe v. Wade, uh, you know, before last year was still, um, you know, upheld, uh, we saw that people were criminalized under this law. And so there's one woman, Anna Yaka, who, uh, you know, was, you know, lives uh, or lived in Rutherford County, so in, in Murfreesboro. And in 2015, uh, she was charged under this law. And she spent the over a year in, in jail before taking a plea wow. deal. And then there was another woman in, in Nashville. I, I just um, want to say, you all were able to really push forward mm -hmm. and, and, and get that law off the books. I do, I do want to move yeah. on to Robin. Mm -hmm. Robin, can you explain to us really briefly what Abortion Care Tennessee does? Yeah, Abortion Care Tennessee is a statewide abortion fund. So previously, before the fall of Roe, we put funding directly into clinics within Tennessee. Um, and so if a patient was having any trouble coming up with money for their procedure, they could access like a grant of like block grant of funding that was available to them. Post Roe, we are funding into clinics outside the state of Tennessee with those funds being earmarked for Tennessee patients traveling there. And then we also fulfill any requests that we get from any clinic around the country or even like another abortion fund around the country that says that, you know, they're trying, you know, a Tennessee patient has contacted them and maybe they've traveled to Colorado or something because a family member lives in Colorado. And then we're also working on a ton of like education initiatives. Um, we're partnering with Beyond Row Collective. We were all trained at the at the training that Brianna just mentioned, um, doing self-managed abortion trainings. And we're hoping to ramp up more like education and community care based services because we don't believe that, you know, the lawmakers in Tennessee are looking out for us. And I think 
as an organization, we're moving away from doing anything with like legislative work and policy. Like we're partnering with other incredible organizations like Healthy and Free Tennessee on stuff like that. But we really want to focus on giving the community, um, empowering the community with the tools they need to to be in control of their own health care because the state is not protecting us. And the state, you know, act has existed since 2019 because the state was already not protecting like the majority of Tennesseans, specifically black, brown, low income communities. So we've existed since 2019 because we were already navigating an inaccessible landscape and post row. It is just let me wildly ask, let me ask you this. Has there been an increased demand for the support you provide since the Dobbs decision? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and and uplifting what someone else already said on this call is that we had this kind of like huge flood of momentum last summer where everyone started running the marathon. And even by the time the, the extreme ban went into effect, which at the beginning, you said that we have one of the most extreme bans in the country, we have the most extreme ban in the country, like by a lot. Um, and, you know, there was this big flood of momentum. And even by the time that ban went into effect in, in August, organizations like ours had already seen like a dwindle in support. And now a year later, it's kind of like we've just been discarded from the like online outrage cycle. And it's it's momentum that needs to be at the very least sustained, but also needs to be increasing as these costs to access care outside of state or, you know, are increasing. Speaking about those costs, have you seen donations to your organizations change since then? Yeah, I mean, we ha we definitely have more reoccurring funders. Like I said, there was this wave of momentum, and a lot of that came from Tennesseans, and then a lot of it came from people outside of Tennessee that, you know, saw what was happening and wanted to support the states most impacted by these bans. Um, so we have lots of funders that are, you know, in different, you know, in access states that they want to be supporting the people most directly impacted. So we definitely saw like a big flood of momentum, but we're you know, not anticipating seeing a flood of momentum like that again. And the, as I mentioned, the costs are just increasing because any person that needs to access like any level of abortion care in Tennessee has to travel outside of the state. Now, L. Robinson with Cookville Community Action is still with us. Now, L, thanks again of for, course. for being here. Now, what are what are the biggest needs in your community right now for reproductive health care? Um, knowledge and access, really. Um like we've said over and over, this is the most restrictive uh, law banning abortion in the nation. People think that it just is not possible to do and that there is no option. Um, but as we've heard from Healthy and Free Tennessee, Abortion Care Tennessee, Planned Parenthood, there are resources available to get out there. There are places to go for information. We've talked, We self-managed abortion has been mentioned one of our things is to just share places to go online to learn about this. I like to point people towards plancpills.org, I believe. Um, yeah, or I need I need an abortion.com. Just and when people we we need to be visible so that people know that there are people around who have this information and who can connect them with these resources. When, when you're talking to somebody and you're connecting them with resources, are folks out there in Cookville, are they worried about the consequences for taking action for their own health? Yes. Yes. Um, we take privacy seriously. Um, we prefer to communicate through um, an encrypted app so that there is no leftover, just in case, because right now talking about abortion and providing this information isn't against the law, but we've been operating under the assumption that that could change at any time. Mm. So folks are worried about the future potentially for organizations like yours being criminalized just for doing this work that right. you're doing. Now, Brianna, talk to me about that. Is, is that a valid concern given the political makeup of the state at the moment? Yeah, that for sure is a valid concern. I know there is talks of legislation um, and just questions around like how far will some legislators go when it comes to, again, like criminalizing the person themselves, which, you know, uh, supposedly wasn't going to be a thing. Uh, and a, a lot of anti-abortion bills, there was something written into it that the pregnant person wouldn't be criminalized. So it's a question about that, uh, loved ones, but also organizations who are providing the support and what it will look like 
like to publicly uh, share things and penalties that people could face for doing so. So that very much so is a valid concern right now. Mm. Now, Robin, when you look at the current makeup of the Supreme Court and our state legislature, both are very conservative. So how do you plan to restore the right to abortion with this present political reality? I mean, as I mentioned, you know, ACT identifies as a health care organization um, on a personal level. I just don't really have a lot of hope on that front at all. And I think we've spent decades and decades, you know, the entire like abortion organizing movement, repro health care organizing movement has put a ton of focus on to like pandering to these lawmakers when we could have maybe been, yeah, developing like structures of community care, empowering people with the tools to take care of themselves and their communities and their families. And instead we've just been, you know, pandering to these lawmakers while they've used something like Roe v. Wade, like as a bargaining chip during elections. So, which is why we knew Roe was always gonna fall. We knew it was never gonna be protected. And so when I think about protecting access to care, yeah, I think about like just what I uplifted about, you know, organizations like Plan C pills, which are, you know, getting people pills in the mail and then wanting to empower them with the tools to facilitate and manage their own abortion, wanting to make sure we're doing a ton of outreach for organizations like ACT so that people know that they have an option so that when they find out they're pregnant, they don't just think, okay, well, I'm in a banned state, so I guess I'm continuing this pregnancy. You know, I really think at least ACT and myself are just moving more towards community care structures and not really, you know, we, we obviously stay on top of what abortion looks like in the, in the legislature on a state level and on a federal level, but we're not, we don't have any like firm plans in place to continue trying to like operate and hoping that lawmakers are going to come to protect us because they have shown, especially within the state of Tennessee, that they're not here to protect the freedom of bodily autonomy for all Tennesseans. Now, we got a tweet at This Is Nashville from Alejandro Guisar. It wrote, quote, it would be helpful for your guests to talk about how men can support women in this abortion issue. Oftentimes, I don't feel like it's my place to talk especially when women's voices are put down. The last thing I want to do is have my voice over a woman's. Now, L, our previous guest, Rebecca, mentioned it. You know, you talked about this before the show, the two of you. What are your thoughts on this for Alejandro? Well, abortion is an issue that affects all of us. As we're we like to bring up these these scenarios if you are pregnant and you need access to an abortion and the worst happens that is very bad um but there are people in that pregnant person's life who are also affected by that I think remembering that it is your mother, your sister, your partner, um, this is your life too. Robin, tell me, what, what do you want folks to be thinking about as we're moving forward? Um, I would uplift, yeah, a lot of what Elle said about, well, specifically, I will say on the, on the men topic that it, it is, you know, it takes two people to get pregnant and abortion men, benefits men 50%. And while I respect the, while I respect the not wanting to talk over women's voices, like we need, we need male identifying people to step up and take on this issue. Because again, this is where we've gotten when it, when, when people, female identifying people and largely women of color have shouldered this this movement for so long and it needs to be a team and group effort and i think the biggest guidance i would say is like what what can you offer because everyone can offer something if you can't monetarily donate you can organize your community to donate the you know everyone pulls in three dollars to fund the cost of an abortion you can talk to businesses in your community and maybe host a fundraiser like there's just so many ways that you can get creative to support organizations like a lot of them, the ones on this call. And vocally, we need to destigmatize abortion. We need to be saying abortion. We need to be talking about it. You know, abortion has really been left out of this like broader constellation of reproductive health 
you know, it's like often the outlier when we're talking about birth work, when we're talking about contraceptive work, and we all need to be normalizing this conversation in our communities. Of course, not everyone is obligated to talk about their own personal experiences with abortion, but really just talking about this and why it impacts everyone and why it impacts the safety of everyone. You know, we say at ACT that if abortion access isn't safe, then no one we're is gonna, safe. We're going to have to leave it here. Robin Baldridge is the president of Abortion Care Tennessee. She was joined by L. Robinson of Cookville Community Action and Brianna Perry of Healthy and Free Tennessee. I want to thank you all for being with us today. Really appreciate it. And thanks to you for tuning in this hour. This is Nashville as a production of WPLN News and Nashville Public Radio. Today's episode was produced by Elizabeth Burton. Our senior producer is Steve Harouche. Our digital lead is Anna Geigos Cannon. Michaela Elias is our technical director. Our executive producer is Andrea Tuthope. The masterminds behind our theme music are LaRange and Namir Blade. And listen back at thisisnashville.org or wherever you get your podcasts. The conversation doesn't end here. Tweet us at thisisnashville. Find us on Instagram and tell us what you want from our show by filling out our quick survey online. This is Nashville. I'm Khalil Ekelona. We'll see you tomorrow, everybody. And be good to each other.